I'm going to lead us in our prayer tonight. And like Woody does, I want us to have just a, a moment of silent prayer and each of you pray, of course, there where you sit. These items that are listed, look at them as you think and other things that are on your heart and then I'll close us in a corporate time. Father and our God, we come to you tonight as very needy people. We need you in every way. We need you, Lord, in our own individual lives. For every one of us in this room carry our own burdens, our own hurts. We carry, Lord, the weight of our families. We carry often the weight of our own weaknesses and illnesses. We carry, Lord, although perhaps we shouldn't, we carry fears and worries for our country and the world around us. Lord, all these things we, f we feel on ourselves. We need you, Lord. We need you to help us to see that you are the sovereign God over our lives and our country and our world. We need, Lord, spiritual eyes that we may understand how you work in the world. Always, Lord, working in the tragedies and the hardships and the dark spots to bring about transformation in the lives of people. We have seen it in our own lives. We know how you do it in the lives of others, in the lives of institutions and countries. But we tend to forget, Lord, that you are never caught by surprise, that you are the God of eternal strength, of unlimited strength and of eternal time who spans the world, who spans the universe. As needy people, help us to know, Lord, that we can absolutely trust you. Lord, we are a needy church. We need your presence among us. We need encouragement for our people. We need vision for the future. We need, Lord, our hearts to beat with your heart so that we will not for a moment feel discouragement, but we will feel the absolute thrill of being your people in this community, carrying your word and your will and your work to the people around us. Lord, we need you as a church. Oh, Father, how we need you as a country. In my almost seven decades, I can't remember a time when we were more bitterly divided as a people who have different political views and different ideas for what kind of people we should be and where we should be going. Lord, I almost don't know how to pray politically, so I'm not even going to try. I pray, Lord, that as the people of God, we will realize that you have an agenda that's far bigger than the country that we live in. You have a plan for history 
that is beyond countries and politics and parties. You have a plan that is focused in the life and death of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's a plan that plays out for eternity, not for the limits of a president or a congress or a country, but for eternity. And Lord, may somehow that idea that you are working in eternal matters to make it so that people go to heaven and not to hell and that those agendas Lord are so far above our agendas may we as your people as your church as we work for justice and as, as we work in our country as good citizens may we never lose focus of the fact that you are the supreme God of the universe who's trying to redeem a people out of sin to yourself and may we join you in that work may we be so far more passionate about that than about anything else that the people of our community will know that the men and women of this church stand for Christ and his message and his gospel and salvation and growing in Christ to be mature followers and sharing that story in our community and around the world. May that be what moves us and what excites us and what gives us hope in this needy country, Lord, there is a need for people like that who stand up for Jesus no matter what else happens around them. Let us be those people. And, oh, God, we, we bring to you this prayer sheet with the names of people and places, of church planters, of whole countries that need your word in this one, the country that we're praying for, uh, is Japan. And Lord, here is this couple whose name we can't say, but you know it, who are planting churches. And men and women who lead us in our associational work and people in our church who are isolated in nursing homes. And this dear little one, Parson, who's been hospitalized, we, we pray for her and for her healing. And restoration we pray for uh, Winnie's family we pray for Ross's family we pray for these others Lord who are fighting disease and loneliness and, and all kinds of struggles you are the God who's bigger than all of that these people are needy and so we come to you with all of our needs we lay them at your feet and we say work your will in all of these and in us for your kingdom's sake. We love you tonight, Lord, for all you are doing in us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Didn't know I had that kind of power. <laughs> I think that was the amen to the prayer, brother. <laughs> That's what it was. That's right. <laughs> the words to this next song have been in my mind and on my heart today. And uh, so I hope that as you sing it, you'll listen to yourself as you sing these words. Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. Let's sing. <laughs> Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. Take care of you. God will take care of you. Through days of toil, when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When 
dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care. As you know, on Wednesday nights, we are dealing with different prayers from all over Scripture. We've been New Testament, Old Testament, and we are for the first time in the book of Psalms, which many of these Psalms, of course, are prayer-like. This one that we're dealing with, Psalm 51, is exactly a prayer, the prayer that David offered after his sin with Bathsheba, after he was called out by Nathan the prophet. We've been at it for some while, but not actually as long as it seems because we've had lots of other Wednesdays that we've done other things, so we, we haven't had every Wednesday on, on this particular psalm. But here's a person who is broken by their sin. We are seeing... His confession, although the word confession is never in here, it is his confession and it is plea to God for a restored relationship. The last time that we dealt with it, I had um, an a unfulfilled expectation that we'd do verses 10, 11, 12, 13, and we did verse 10. So, <laughs> so I didn't get very far into that. So tonight, we're, we're attacking 11, 12, and 13. That's where, that's where we are. But let me read, starting with verse 5, and read down through verse 13, and then we will pick up in that, at that section. Here are David's words. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Now, of course, there's more to the chapter, and we will deal with that in future Wednesday nights, but let's see how far we can get here. We dealt quite at length with verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit or a steadfast spirit within me. You know that this is Hebrew parallelism. We've talked about that several times so that 
even though there are completely different words in each of the lines, they are, for the most part, saying the same thing. They are saying a, a rhyme of the idea. Some commentators in verse 10, I know I've already done it, but you got to warm up into it, will put a slightly different focus on the heart and the spirit. They will say both of these phrases in verse 10 are David's cry to be clean, to be new, for his, his relationship with God to be restored. The heart gives a bit of a focus into the human side. Here is my heart, where the spirit tends to be a bit more of an outward look. And kind of what I mean by that is um, a piece that a professor in seminary years ago helped us with when we asked him to help us understand spirit. What is spirit? For we have kind of a mental image that pops up when you think about spirit. Uh, you can have a similar mental image with the word soul. They're likely not the best mental image, but if I said, how do you explain spirit? What is that all about? You would, before you could help yourself, you would almost have a mental image of something that was somewhat like a ghost or something. A spirit is, you know, maybe your body dies and there's this sort of Casper, the friendly ghost character that kind of bounces out and wanders around or something. Probably not the best concept for what that word means. I don't know that I have the best concept. Um, the spirit in both the Hebrew word and the Greek word, as you know, make reference that they can, the same word is used to talk about wind or to talk about spirit. It's translated both ways. Uh, the Hebrew word being ruach and the Greek word being pneuma. And so both of them can, they can mean the wind, this thing that blows, you can't see it, you can feel it, you know it's there, you have no doubt, it comes rushing through, it has great power. And yet that word is used to describe something about God. Pneuma does the same thing in Greek. So when we ask the professor, what is, how should we think about the word spirit? He said, well, I don't know exactly what mental image to give you, but I can tell you that when you think about something like heart, you get a focus on the human dimension. This is what allows me to relate to the world around me, the physicality of who I am. My eyes, my ears, my nose, my mouth, my hands, my feel, all of this stuff allows me to experience that he said, whatever it is that is spirit about us, it is that which allows us to experience God. For eyes and ears and nose and mouth and hands can't grasp God or see God or smell God or hear God or taste God. So that sort of heart concept is that aspect of human that allows us to relate to this world. But this isn't all there is. There is stuff we can't see. There's a whole, dimension might not be the right word, but it, there's this whole something out there that is undetectable by eyes and ears and nose and mouth and hands. And we can relate to that too. God has made us in such a way that we are not cut off from that which our eyes and ears and nose and hands and so forth can't touch. And the way that we relate to that is he has given us this capacity that we can call spirit. That kind of description takes it completely away from attenuated matter or ghost-like stuff. You know, the, it's so stretched out that you can't see it, but it's still sort of like, maybe I don't know if it's atoms or if it's plasma. It's none of that. Whatever spirit is, it is that which gives us the capacity to relate to God. Without it, we could not, we would be like, well, maybe the animals, as far as we know. 
They may have wonderful awareness of God. They can't tell us if they do. As far as we know, they can just relate to this world here. But we are different. And so in verse 10, when David makes this cry, give me a clean heart that this capacity that I have to relate to the world around me, make it clean, make it right. But this capacity that I have to relate to you, God, that which is spirit, renew it. Renew it. And that was the biggest thing. The physical aspect of David had gone into a horrible place with his eyes and his ears and his mouth and his hands and his words and whatever else. He had created great evil. But the most horrible thing about what he had done is the relationship that had been slaughtered between him and a loving God. And so his capacity to relate to this God was deeply marred. And everybody who is sensitive to sin knows that the deeper hurt is between myself and God. I can do things that just horribly inflict pain on other people's lives. But the sin that I do that inflicts great pain upon you inflicts even worse pain upon God. I believe that is true. The old theologian said that God was impassable. He didn't feel these things. I don't think that's true. I think the pain that God feels over our sin was so intense or is so intense that he took the cross. The cross is the symbol of the pain that he took into his life. And that was so that our capacity to relate to God's spirit, whatever that is within us, this capacity that we uniquely have of all creation to relate to God is horribly marred. And so David feels that terribly. Renew it. Renew this spirit within me. And so having said verse 10 again, <laughs> I'm sorry. Verse 11, we had started on, don't cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. There's almost no sadder, phrase in all of scripture than that one right there now David would have deep concern for this because he knew what had happened to Saul you remember Saul who was the first king if you look for just a second over in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 14 Saul had he was supposed to wait on um, Samuel, the prophet, to come and to make some sacrifices before they would enter into a particular battle. And he waited a while, and then he just gave up, and he went ahead and did the sacrifices himself. It's hard for us to understand the level of the offense that that was, but obviously Saul knew that it was something he was never supposed to do, and Samuel just gave him grief over it. But as a result of what he had done there, verse 14 happens. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And we're not even going to try to work with the last half of that. An evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Someday we may have to come back and look at some difficult passages like that one. But the point I wanted to make is that Saul was aware, I believe he was aware, that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was not something that came onto or into the lives of all believers. It came onto or into, or he came onto or into the lives of particular people to empower them to do certain jobs. So there was a handful of folks when they were building the tabernacle, they received the Spirit of God so that they could do these great deeds of forming and shaping the parts of the tabernacle. We are told that on all of the prophets that the Spirit descended upon them and there were there were the school of the prophets that we know very little about but a lot of these folks who were part of the school of the prophets that experienced the holy spirit too well all of the kings at their anointing they received the spirit of god so that they could do the work of the king and it happened to saul but whereas we have this very strong conviction as christians and as baptist christians 
that once the Holy Spirit of God comes into your life, the Holy Spirit of God never leaves you. Never. When you come to Him by faith and you trust Jesus as your personal Savior, His Spirit comes to abide in your life and you can grieve the Spirit and you can harm the Spirit and you can embarrass the Spirit, but you can't push Him out. He's going to stay there and He's going to convict you and He's going to whatever, but you can't push Him out. But that wasn't the case in Old Testament times. Here was Saul. The Spirit of God had come upon him after this sin and he grieved God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit left him. So now David, I believe, was aware that that had happened because David had been anointed by Samuel too and received this Spirit to be able to come the, the next king. And now he's committed a sin of grievous nature, killed one of his leaders and took his wife. And So the whole thing that we know so well. So he is quite concerned there in verse 11 that God might would take his Holy Spirit away from him. I made the point uh, the last time I talked about this, just as we were getting into it, that fish were, were made for, for water and birds were made for the air. And maybe you caught that, maybe not, but a fish does not know he is in the water. He doesn't know it. Now, if you take him out of the water, he knows that he's not in it anymore. You put him in the water, that's his environment. So he just swims and he lives there and that's all he knows. Or it might be a girl fish, so that's all she knows. Or it might not be a fish at all. It might be an octopus or a whole, you know, all those creatures that live in the water, they were made to live in the water. That's their environment. And I know that birds can land on the ground and walk around like that, but when, when they're in the air, it's sort of like a, I, I don't know, it seems to be like sort of like a balloon. When you're in a balloon, you don't feel the wind because you're just carried along with the wind. Birds are just, they're made for the environment of the air. That's where they are. We're made, we are made for the environment of the Holy Spirit. When we come to Christ and we trust Him, that becomes our environment. A lot of people, when they first trust in Christ, they have a very distinct sense of life is different. It happened to me, even as a young child, that when I came to trust in Christ, it, I, I couldn't articulate it, I didn't understand it, but there had been this change this movement from being one who just lived in the world to one who lived within the sphere of the Holy Spirit and we have lived our whole adult Christian lives within the sphere of the Holy Spirit now if that were removed from you it would be like taking a fish out of the water sometimes we don't sense the presence the hovering presence of the Spirit on us because we live in it all the time. But if it were removed from us, I dare say we would feel it very keenly to know that the presence of God that we have lived in and gotten accustomed to is all of a sudden gone. That's how this becomes such a sad, sad verse where David offers this prayer don't cast me away and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. There would be nothing worse for a Christian. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That in the New Testament, we learn and know that that will not happen. Now, I believe that we can grieve the Spirit to such an extent that we are very aware that we have done so. But He's not going to leave you. What a great joy that is. Whew. Thank you. There is sort of an, well, it's more than sort of, it's just sort more of the interesting pictures that sort of bounce out of these passages. You, you, you remember back in verse 9 where the poetic flow of the prayer was hide your face from my sin so that this is the action of God. Hide your face from my sin. And then the second part of verse 9 was blot out my iniquity. So this was the action of God. To himself he hid his face. To me he covered my sin. There was this kind of twofold action. Hide your face, blot out my sin. That's very intentional, I believe, on the part of David that he wrote with that sort of poetic view in there. Hide your face from my sin, blot it out from me. Uh, in sign language it just works really good because you get the hands going, you see? All right, well now verse 11, 
don't cast me away from your presence. So, so like, here I am. The first part of it is he may take me and throw me away. But the second part is, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So it's like, don't throw me that way and don't throw the Spirit this way. You know, cover your face, blot out my sin. Don't do this, don't do that. I wish you were all deaf. Well, I mean, you know, we all are all kind of deaf, aren't we? I could just, and you would say, oh, look at the hands. They just have that so nice little picture, don't they? But again, I, I think there's, it's like all good poetry that just has levels and levels and levels, like a good onion. You know how you, you peel off the outer layer and then there's an inner layer and you peel that off and there's another layer and you peel that off. And so it's like, that's what happens in good Hebrew poetry. You read the words, oh, and then you start, well, all of these other little subtle things in there. He, God hid his face. God blotted out me. God threw it away. Don't throw me away, God. God, don't go away from me. All of those kind of little layers of the onion get peeled off as you look kind of deeper and deeper into it. So, verse 12 comes back very clearly to the restoration concept that we've seen in these verses. He's confessed the darkness of his sin and sin did my mother conceive me. From all the way back, he was, he's been in this environment of sin. He has sinned by a wicked action and he wants to be restored to God, which is what all sensitive sinners like us want. So, in verse 12, his approach to the restoration is to create, create a clean heart. And in verse 11, the restoration is, don't cast me away. And in verse 12, the restoration is, restore the joy. Make something new, don't cast away, don't, go, don't let your presence go from me, but now give me back the joy. And there's... It's, it's like, have you ever just sinned? <laughs> After church, you can come by. Well, I'll put on my, I'll turn my collar over, you know. If you have, more than likely, you can identify with these statements. I felt the weight of my rebellion against my beloved Savior. And I, oh, how I wanted to be new. The, the terrible, horrible, frightening thought that somehow our relationship is broken. Can we restore it? And then give me back the joy of my salvation. The joy that I had of living for Christ. And so that's what he's pleading for. Restore to me the joy of your salvation well sin offers a lot of stuff sin says to us that I can give you something that you want sin says I can make you happier than what you are and you know, sin does actually give you a kick. Sin can give you a charge of dopamine that's a pleasure thing. Whether, whether you stole it or whether you did something you weren't supposed to do, of course, so many would say you chased after some kind of substance and that substance gave you a kick for a little while. Or you chased after an illicit relationship and it gave you some pleasure for a little while. But you know what it didn't give you? It didn't give you joy. Now we've, we've talked about that in several different approaches to it. Uh, I, I can't work through the Hebrew word for joy at all, but I have worked with it with you before on the Greek word with joy that the stem for that word joy is the same stem for the word grace 
In its verbal form, it's the same stem for the word rejoice. It's also the same stem for the word gift, charisma, kara. All of those are wrapped up ideas. Joy is that outer expression, or excuse me, joy is an inner sense. Rejoicing is the outer expression of the inner sense. But when you're in that right relationship with God, the circumstances of life can be brutal, but an inexplicable joy can still be felt. Now, I know that's true. And you're, you're in there with me academically. Yes, I believe that. That's my doctrine. Well, the other day, the other day, Woody and I went to visit Miss Winnie. It was on Saturday, wasn't it? And uh, she was not in a good spot. And she's in a good spot now. She's in a good spot now. It was, it was, it, we knew that she was not very long for this world. She was laying on the couch. She was under uh, medication that could cloud the mind. Um, she looked at us through dim eyes. She knew who we were. And we visited. Family was there. We told stories. We laughed. I don't know so much that she laughed. She was just there on the couch. But then we got to a time where we wanted to pray, and Woody prayed a, a lovely prayer with us there. And I hope you don't mind me telling this story, Woody. I didn't ask for permission, I'm sorry. And then Woody said, <laughs> Woody said to Miss Winnie, would you like to pray? And she said, yes. And she started to pray. There was not much that we could understand. Her voice was very weak. Her words were slurred. I, I don't know how much of it made sense. If we could have understood, I, I, I don't know. But we couldn't catch many of the words. But every once in a while, we did catch a word. Now, you've got to understand the scene. She's not long for this world. She's 98. She's laying on the couch. She's close to the end. You know the words we understood? I could say them in a minute. <laughs> she said, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Was that joy? I don't know who lives to be 98 and knows they're not long for the world. Lays on the couch in a shrunken form, soon to be with Jesus, I, I, and says, thank you. Thank you. No matter the outer circumstance, what's going on on the outside, there's this something that springs from the heart that's bigger than years or pain or death. Come on, bigger than death. Yeah, yes. It lays on a couch and says, thank you, Father. Whoa. David risked losing that. And so do we when we sin so he prayed restore the joy the joy of the salvation of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit I don't know exactly what the second stanza means sustain me with a willing spirit the scholars debate that uh, it's supposed to, suppose, sometimes it looks like it's the Holy Spirit. In other interpretations, it's the human spirit, a willing spirit. 
because it's so unclear as far as the translation and exactly what it means, I, I, really, I can't go anywhere with it. So I'm going to go on to verse 13. You work on the last part of verse 12. But thir verse 13 sums up this little paragraph. Here's David asking for a clean heart, a restored relationship with the Father, a joy in salvation, and then he makes sort of a promise to God. Create in me, don't cast me away, restore your presence, restore the joy, and then I will teach transgressors your ways. Well, at first blush, it almost looks like as though David has made a little transaction with God. You know, there's a little bit of a deal here, a quid pro quo. You do this for me, and I'll do this for you. And I, I think if, if that were your interpretation of where this went, I, I think you went to a wrong spot. This is not a transaction. You do something, I'll do something. This is a sequence. The sequence of events is you create a new heart and you restore the relationship and you return to me your joy. And then out of this healed relationship, here's what happens. So it's sequence, it's sequential. You have done all of this. Oh God, I will do this. I will teach transgressors your ways. There aren't very many sinners who enjoy teaching other sinners how to be godly. <laughs> it's just, there's not much that they think about. But someone who has experienced the cleansing and the forgiving and the restoration and the new joy that comes, they want to tell somebody else. We, this is a sad fact, and I think it in part comes from the fact that we've gotten so accustomed to living in holiness that we don't quite know how to share it. We live in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and now it's just become routine. We forget that we are living in an extraordinary position as Christians. And so we tend not to tell other people about what it is that we have. But someone who has recently come out of darkness into light, they tend to be talkative about the new experience that they have in Christ. Perhaps it happened to you when you were a new Christian. Or you've seen it happen to others who come to Jesus and then tell somebody about it. Well, David was a believer who had sinned and now this re the relationship is being restored. But he understands that he will have a similar experience to the one who was a non-believer and now became a believer and for the first time is walking in the light and wants to tell somebody else about it. So he realizes that when this relationship has been restored, the thing that will happen is I will tell somebody else. I'm going to tell sinners where they can find this kind of cure for the brokenness of life people who have transgressed the law, I'm going to tell them your ways. Sinners, those who have fallen short, they will be converted to you. They will come to believe because they have seen what happens to me. That would be the piece that I'd want to leave you with is that in Christ, we have received so much, such a good, the newness of life, the newness of purpose, I am convinced with every fiber of my being that you and I can see the sort of thing that has happened in our world today and be grieved by that, but carry a message to our community of love and hope and eternal goodness and the rightness of God and the sovereignty of God we don't have to go to our community and say, oh, whoa, look what happened. We will grieve over that. And whatever political persuasion you bring to it. But I am convinced that we can see that kind of horror. Like our forefathers before us saw the horror of world war and still told the story of Jesus with conviction. 
there's this kind of horror that goes on. But let me tell you about the goodness of God who loves us and changes our life and refocuses us, refocuses us to be his people in a broken and lost world. That's good news. That's worth telling. It is far more, more better. <laughs> the grammarian just messed up. It is so much better. It is so much better, the story we have to tell about Christ and restoration and created new hearts and restored relationship and cleanliness and the, the joy that he gets. That is so much more important that I will be somewhat disappointed in us if tomorrow the main topic of our conversation is Washington, D.C. and not Jesus Christ. Now we'll talk about Washington, D.C., but I challenge you I challenge you to use that as a stepping stone to this. I challenge you to do it. Let's pray. Oh, Father God. You are such a good God. And you want us to be such a consecrated people. Thank you, Lord, that every once in a while you send somebody like like Miss Winnie along that we can learn from. Lord, thank you also that your word from 3,000 years ago can challenge us to be the kind of Christians we need to be today in light of the circumstances in our own country and in our world. What a marvelous God you are. What a fantastic word you give to us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to live tomorrow as people who have new hearts and restored spirits and a joy that transcends the circumstances. May we be your people in this community. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everyone.